Hi, everybody, and welcome to your Ron Brooks show. Actually, the, the last episode for a while that I'm going to be able to do from, uh, from my home. I uh, go on the road tomorrow uh, for, for about two and a half weeks. So timing of future shows might, uh, might move around a little bit, depending on my availability. But I will keep you all updated via Twitter and Facebook. And if you don't follow me on Twitter and Facebook, you should. On Twitter, it's Yaron Brook, Y-A-R-O-N-B-R-O-O-K. And on Facebook, it's Ybrook, Y-B-R-O-O-K. So thank you all for joining me. And uh, I, I think this is going to be an interesting show today. We, we're going to talk about Milo. We're also going to talk about this idea of um, anti-ideology, which, um, which I get from Ayn Rand, like most of my ideas. I'm, I'm uh, you know, in, in that sense, she is my teacher. In, in almost every sense, she is my teacher. The book uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna cover this as Out of Capitalism, Not Knowing Deal, a, a fabulous essay. Everybody should read the wreckage of the consensus. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant stuff. We'll we'll, we'll talk about that. Anti ideology fitted in with uh, with Milo and with the Trump administration and with the left and with just the general world in which we live, which I think is a is a, a significantly anti ideological world. However, before I get to any of that, uh, there's another point issue I want to cover that really comes out of our discussion from last week. So if you remember last week, we talked about selfishness. Uh, What does rational self-interest really mean? What does it imply? We talked about uh, the centrality of rationality and really selfishness means think, think, think. But I, I want to cover a point which, which I think we often, uh, in, in some sense, whitewash. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm often guilty of this. And we kind of try to soft sell what self-interest really means. Um, oh, well, really self-interested people are nice to people and self-interested people would do charity and self-interested people. And, and to the point where many objectivists um, whitewash it so much that you start losing any kind of distinction between real self-interest, the rational pursuit of one's own real values, one's own real life, one's own happiness one starts to lose the distinction between that and altruism and living for the sake of other people because, hey, living for the sake of other people makes you feel good. So maybe we do some of that. And and so I want to make clear, I want to make clear that, um, you know, that that's not what self-interest is. Self-interest really means self-interest, really self-interest, really pursuing what's good for you. And that this can sometimes be difficult, but it never, never involves sacrifice. And um, and and let's, you know. So, so I want to give you an example of this. And again, I for those of you just joining now, I will get to Milo, and and we will get to that discussion. But I, I'd like to cover this point first. And I know most of you here that listen to my to my discussion of Milo, so I figured I'd capture you and talk about a philosophical point about self interest. I want to give you. An example that I saw on a TV show, which I think illustrated uh, this whole issue of uh, selfishness uh, and and kind of the the, the, the softening the softening of selfishness uh, really really well. All right, so um, this is a TV show in which now it's a little complicated, so you'll have to bear with me. Right, this is a this is a a, a TV show in which they're trying to do these these kidney transplants but because of the way uh you know compatibility works what they're doing is a chain of of kidney transplants right so uh, my spouse cannot donate i need a kidney right i need a new kidney so you're you're gonna have to follow me here i need a new kidney and my spouse can donate a kidney to me because we're not compatible so she finds somebody else she finds somebody else who she can donate the kidney to, who is compatible, and obviously who needs a kidney. We don't want to just we don't want to just cut people up and replace the kidney for for nothing. Um, but uh, you know we uh, so you donate the kidney to the second person, and think of it that their spouse then donates the kidney to me, right? So it's this circle, right? It's a circle where everybody's depending on somebody else getting compatible, being compatible, 
and getting the kidney uh, ultimately, right? So on the show, there was a circle like this, but a seven different transplants. So seven different people were getting their kidney transplant all at once. And the whole circle was dependent on every pair actually happening, right? So on all of them happening. Because if you break the chain once, if you break the chain, then the incentive for all the other transplants goes away because you can't complete the circle. You know, if you do it on three, if uh, my wife then has to donate a kidney to somebody else and that somebody else is going to give it to me, if my wife lands up not being able to give the kidney to this other person, I'm not going to get the kidney. So my life is gone, right? So it's, it's a circle and uh, you've got to get everybody's buy-in and they have to commit and all the transfers happen, have to happen pretty much at the same time so nobody gets hurt and everybody is better off. Now, some people are donating a kidney without getting a direct benefit other than that they love their spouse. And uh, so like my wife would be giving up a kidney to some stranger in order for me to live. So she's doing it f for the sake of me living, all right? And, and, you know, we can go into why that is selfish on her part. I, I think it's kind of obvious, love and the importance of love and the value of love and, and so on. And, and somebody so valuable to you, you're willing to risk your life going through a transplant. Okay, but this is, this is what happens on the show. They've got this circle done where they're doing seven, seven kidney transplants in one day. And um, one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the circle is this woman and her daughter. And the daughter is a ballet dancer. And the daughter, you know, you got to follow me on this. There's going to be a point, I promise you, right? The ballet dancer is, uh, is about to get like the dream job in the Paris Ballet, right? She's going to reach her dream uh, ability to perform. You know, this is her, this is the next big step in her career. This is what, this is her primary value. Her mother is dying and she is going to have to contribute, the daughter is going to have to contribute a, a kidney to some stranger which is going to set back her career dramatically. She's going to have to give the kidney to some stranger so that the circle can continue and come back to helping her mother. So while she's giving up her kidney for a stranger, her mother is going to benefit from it, right? So the circle is complete. Her mother gets it. And she's saying to herself, I'm willing to do this because it's my mother and I love my mother, right? So again, this could be in her self-interest. It could be selfish, depending on how much you love your mother. She really loves her mother. This is really important. She couldn't live with herself. She let her mother die. It, it's her mother. It's her value. She's willing to take a significant step back in her career in order to do it. Okay, so, so that's kind of understandable, and we can say it's still kind of in your self-interest. I'm not sure I would do it for my mother, but... You know, I can see when there's a relationship that's really close and really love-based that somebody would want to do that, that somebody would want to do that, okay? Okay, so then what happens, then what happens is that the final transfer of a kidney for the mother can't happen. It can't happen. So the woman who is going to give the mother a transplant, it turns out she's pregnant, they're not going to do the. They're not going to do that transplant. So, this is the option faced by the woman, by by the daughter, right? She can continue to contribute her kidney, and get six people will get kidney transplants, but her mother will die. Or she cannot donate a kidney at all. Her mother dies, but so do six other people, right? Her mother's dead no matter what, right? So now the question is. Is she willing now to sacrifice for six strangers? And initially, her response is uh, to give up a kidney, not to sacrifice, to give up a kidney for six strangers, right? And initially, her response is, no, I've got my career. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave. It's not my problem. They're not my responsibility. And, and she's leaving out. And then one of the doctors takes her to meet this cute kid and in order to convince her to give up her career in order to in order to save the lives of six people. Now, I think that is horrific altruism. That is horrific sacrifice. 
It's her career. It's her life. You walk away from that hospital. Six people will die. It's not your responsibility. You do not have to give up a kidney to save people in order to be a good person. It's the same is true of every one of you. There's somebody out there who needs a kidney. Is it your moral responsibility not to go to a hospital in the name of saving somebody's, saving somebody's life? I mean, that is absurd. So a true, selfish, egoistic, rationally self-interested thing to do is to walk out of that hospital and six people die. Six people die. It's not your responsibility to save people's lives. Even when you can, it's not your responsibility. Every one of us could take most of our paycheck and send it to Africa and save people's lives. But it would be wrong to do it. It'd be wrong to save the lives of people who you don't know, who are strangers to you, if it, if it costs you. Whether that cost is money, whether that cost is a kidney, whether that cost is time, whether that cost is something more. Now, sure, there's a point in which you're willing to do it, right? If they're, if, if they're close, if they're near, if it doesn't cost you that much, if it's easy. But notice that all of us make this choice. Almost everybody on the planet makes the choice of not giving up most of their income to save somebody because it's not that important. The lives of African children. I mean, this is going to be horrible to say, but, you know, this is a show on Milo, so you can say outrageous things. The lives of African children are not that valuable to me in the sense, not in the sense that I would hurt them. I would never hurt them. They're human beings. But in a sense that I know they're dying over there and I'm not sending money. I, I've never sent money to Africa. I'm not interested in sending money to Africa. I, I, I do very little charity. I'm not a big proponent of charity. I don't think charity is bad. And in the, in the context of certain charities and in the context of certain parts of our lives, one would give to charity. But if human life, qua human life of strangers was the most important thing to you, then there's a lot of things you could do, but it's not. And it shouldn't be. Rationally, it's your life, your happiness, your career. If I'm not going to be, if, if my dream is to be a ballet dancer, right? It is, and don't worry, again, channeling Milo a little bit. If my dream is to be a, a, a ballet dancer, and my kidney could save a bunch of people, a hundred people, a thousand people, but that would cause me to give up my, my uh, dancing career, forget it. I'm not doing it. I'm not. I'm going to be self-interested. I'm going to pursue my career. So... And so you you can't, I mean, there's too much of this. And, and as a consequence, in a truly free economy, they're going to be people who suffer and who don't get help. And they won't. They might not be charity. Some people don't deserve charity. Okay. Um, so we are... We are talking about self-interest. We're talking about selfishness. Selfishness, self-interest means really understanding what is good for you long term. Right? And I'm just going to comment on this, although I know most of you don't do the chat and most of you, you know, thousands of people listening to the show, very few people are on the chat. But I have to say that stupid idiots who evaluate what I'm going to say on Milo based on one comment I made so far on Milo when I said the rest of the show is going to be dedicated to him are uh, just being idiotic and stupid. So stop it. Wait until I actually say something before you evaluate. You might not agree with me anyway, but uh, this is exactly the kind of stupid mentality that is, you know, destroying any conversation in this country. All right. We're going to take a quick call and then we're going to go and discuss Milo. Uh, I guess my point was, Egoism really means egoism. Self-interest really means self-interest. It really means pursuing your values, using reason in the pursuit of your own values. It means being rational about your life and putting an um, uh, your existence, your health, your uh, ability to pursue values, uh, the, the, the quality and the, and the, uh, of your mind, all of that, all of that, is uh, 
you know, is 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 what self interest, you know, requires, right? And it's it's not about uh, putting on scales how many people are going to die. That's not the relevance. What's relevant is your life. It's you. All right, we're going to take this call and then we're going to we're going to uh, start on Milo. Yeah, hi, you're in the Iran Book Show. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? I can now. Yes. Hi. Yeah, I was just wondering what you think about uh, the possibility of uh, people paying for transplantable organs. You know, especially the kind that you can live with only one of. Yeah, I'm not. I, I don't want to get into that. It's a whole other discussion. But I'm basically for a market in organs. I I, I think your um, your uh, what do you call it? You, you know your body's yours, and if you uh, if you think you know if you value um, if it's important for you to 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 get money from selling an organ, and and uh, you're desperate for money, why would you deny that? Why would you deny that from people? You'd solve the whole shortage of organs. You'd save lots of people. You'd get people money um, who are willing to take that risk. So I'm all for it. But but let me. I'm not. I don't. I didn't want to talk about that topic. So I'm. I'm going to delay it, postpone it for a future shows. Is that okay? Okay. Thanks. Thank you. But yeah, I'm for. I'm for a market, a free market in organs, in organs, and I think it would it would contribute a lot. All right. So uh, so I have uh, over the last. Uh, few days immersed myself in uh, all things Milo and uh, I, I've, I've read his I've read his articles I've, uh, I've read I haven't read everything and I haven't watched everything because man the guy's prolific I mean it's it's pretty amazing how much stuff is out there from I'd say the last couple of years that Milo has produced uh, he, he gives talks on campuses he's given dozens of them uh, many of the talks on campuses are uh, uh, completely different topics so he and he writes the talks out, which is interesting. He stands at the podium and he actually reads the talks, which, which is which is interesting. You wouldn't have expected uh, that. So I don't know if he has a staff who writes them. Um, he ad libs a lot off of the talks. He riffs off of the talks, but he actually has a lot of talks. Uh, you can find the full text of many of his talks on Breitbart. Uh, it, you know, so if you if you um, if you go to the Breitbart website and and you look up Milo. You can find full text of many of his talks. And he doesn't do the same talk. It doesn't look uh, over again. He, he covers a, a wide uh, array of topics. Almost all of them uh, centered around cultural issues. He doesn't, he doesn't really talk about economics. So he, doesn't, he talks a little bit about politics. But most of them uh, are, are culturally based. Um, he, he, as most of you know, he, he, he resigned from Breitbart this last week. And we'll get to that. Uh, we'll get to Milo's downfall, but uh, but uh, uh, he, he was very prolific uh, on uh, on Breitbart up until last week, and and uh, he was giving he was giving this uh, this speaker tour on campuses um, called the Dangerous Faggot tour, and and uh, you know I'm going to be using a lot of four letter words because that's what Milo uses, so it, it's hard to describe Milo and what he does and how he does it without uh, without um, uh, using four letter words. Um, so I've read, I've read a bunch of his uh, talks, not all of them. Right? So those of you going to say you haven't listened to this one from, you know, March of 15, I haven't read all of them. I haven't listened to all of them. I've listened to many of his interviews from Dave Rubin to uh, the thing he did with Bill Maher to, uh, to what he did with Joe Rogan and, and others. I, I listened to some of the, the stuff on, on, uh, you know, the whole reason for why, He's being kicked out, and why uh, why he's had to apologize and everything. So I've listened to some some of those, although I'm sure I haven't listened to everything and and uh, so forth. So for those of you worried that I have I don't know anything about Milo, I, I I've done my homework. I'm sure it's never going to be good enough for many of you uh, because I'm sure you'll find some obscure thing uh, that that contradicts me. Fine, um, but uh, you know I probably I've read one, two, three, four, five, six of his talks. I've actually read, I've watched a bunch of others, I've watched a lot of his Q&As, so he, he's particularly good, we'll get to what good means, but he's particularly good in Q&As, he's particularly good off the cuff, um, and, uh, you know, uh, so, he's a, and, and I have to say, um, a, a few things, let's start with a, with a lot of the positives, um, he's really smart, <laughs> the guy is really smart, and he's great on his feet, which I think is an expression of, of, of being smart. So it's not, he, you know, he, he, his prepared stuff and he riffs off his prepared stuff. 
that's that's okay but many a lot of people can do that but he does q and a's really well um he, he his interview with dave rubin and his other interviews he's quick he's smart he's incredibly articulate partially it's his british accent which which uh, i always find people with british accents sound smarter than anybody else um but you know the guys the guys he he knows a lot about the topics he's talking about um he is very quick, very quick, very, very sharp and funny. I mean, uh, in spite of myself, and I'll say in spite of myself, uh, in a, I'll explain later, uh, I find myself laughing at, at a lot of what he says. I find it interesting to see what people laugh at, um, you know, the, the audiences. I often don't laugh when the other people are laughing. But I find it interesting to see what people are laughing at and what actually provokes them. And I think at the end of the day, this is part of why he got into the trouble he got into is, uh, is uh, because of, of the kind of things that his audience responds, uh, you know, responds to. So uh, he's funny. He's smart. He's incredibly articulate. Um, he, he, he's good looking and he knows he's good looking and he uses that, uh, he uses that, uh, in- incredibly well. Um, but what is he? I mean, what is, uh, Milo? So what's, what's, what's his purpose? What, what, what is he out there? I mean, is he, is he a comedian? It took me a while to try to figure this out. I mean, is he a comedian or does he use comedy? Right. And, and so, you know, I don't think he's a comedian. He's not doing a stand up routine. His, his shtick is not about comedy. He's trying to use comedy in order to express a point of view. He, he is an intellectual. He's, an in, 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 he's a public figure, or, or was, we'll see if he still is. He's a public figure with an intellectual agenda, with a point of view. And uh, he's very effective as uh, using comedy and using uh, the points that he's trying to make in order to convey a, a particular point of view. And uh, the point of view you know, we'll, we'll get in a minute to what that point of view is. And he, he's very good at self-effacing humor. Uh, he's very good at, you know, he's very good at, at using the F word and, you, and, and, uh, and swearing all the time because that gets a laugh. Uh, it's always gotten a laugh since Lenny, Lenny Bruce started in the 1960s. Uh, the thing that gets the most laugh is when you swear, um, which is interesting as a cultural phenomena. But, uh, he has a, a particular, you know, intellectual agenda. He, he, he wants to achieve something out there in the world. He is driven by achieving something. And, and it's, it's interesting to try to figure out what that is because he's full of contradictions. He contradicts himself constantly. Um, because I, 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 at the end of the day, my bottom line is he, he's not a thinker. He, he can't really think well. Uh, he's not a, he's not a systematic thinker. Uh, he doesn't have principles. He doesn't know what a principle looks like. Um, what is he trying to achieve at the end of the day? And, and it was interesting because in an interview with, with, um, with Dave Rubin, I think he actually said it And the interview with Dave Rubin is very good because he, he's relaxed and he's actually saying what he thinks. He's not putting on a show because there's no live audience to laugh. Right? So when you get away from the show, you you get you get him more serious and you get actually what he's about and he says he says i mean he calls himself basically what he is is an engine of chaos what he wants is chaos um he says what what does he want to achieve politically right what is his big support for trump he's a huge trump supporter what what does he want what does he want um what does he want to achieve politically he wants to blow up the system he wants to smash things, but particularly political correctness, right? He, but, he, but he also says in that interview, he wants to destroy the Republican Party. He wants to destroy the Democratic Party. He doesn't want either one of these parties to be elected. Then he kind of says something about what he really wants is a, is a pro-freedom party versus a status party. But what he really wants is this chaos, right? So he, he he's kind of goes, goes back and forth, uh, goes back and forth uh, about this. <clears throat> well, he's, he is, he is 
a, you know, again, he, he, this is, goes back to what I called him last week, which is a nihilist. There's definitely an element. Right now, I, I'll take that back. He's not quite as nihilistic as I thought he was. But there's definitely an element of nihilism in him. There's definitely an element of what he really wants is everybody going out there and being able to say what they want to say, offend everybody they want to offend, uh, you know, uh, even on private property, even on somebody else's stuff. This is why he attacks uh, Twitter as violating his free speech. Um, he, he, wants, he wants this all, it's complete subjectivism, right? He, he keeps saying, by the way, he keep, again, this is a contradiction. He keeps saying that he's evidence-based. He keeps saying it's all about evidence. I want evidence, just evidence, right? Um, but then what he what really wants is chaos, right? What he wants is the chaos. And he, he wants to be able to say whatever he wants to say without any evidence. He never presents evidence when he's making a positive case. And again, I challenge anybody to show me that. He, he presents a lot of evidence to slam the left and their case, particularly feminists, uh, uh, particularly kind of gay rights advocates or particular type of gay rights. Now, I remember uh, uh, he is very overtly and, and very, um, uh, very explicitly gay. He's, he's, you know, he, he, this is, this is a sh his shtick. It's, it's a big part of what he is and how he defines himself. Um, he, the, way I define, the way I define nihilism is uh, uh, wanting to knock things down for the sake of knocking them, things down, wanting to knock things down for the sake of chaos, wanting to bring about chaos, being an engine for chaos, not being an engine for destroying leftist ideology, not being an engine for knocking down falsehoods, but being, as he defined himself, an engine of chaos, blowing apart the system, right? Smashing, using that term, that's, that's nihilistic. That's, that's what, what, what is nihilistic about, about him. And you can tell that by just the way he engages in intellectual ideas and, and the language and the way he puts down his enemies, the way he addresses issues. Uh, it's all over the place. It's, it's disintegrated and it's about smashing things. It's about uh, destroying things. Um, and and it's 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 not just by the way about smashing um, the left. It's not just about feminism. It's not. It's it's also about secularism. You know, he's very 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 anti secularism. Uh, not just leftist anti secularism. He he considers himself a Catholic. But note even with regard to his Catholicism. Uh, let me see if I could find this quote. Um, he says, "But I am a Catholic." And I do believe in God, even as I recognize that the church is for sinners and I'm one of the most enthusiastic sinners. Somewhere else, I, 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 I heard him say, I don't have the direct quote. He says, every day I violate the seven deadly sins. I check them off. It's like what he does every day. I mean, even his approach to his own Catholicism is nihilistic, right? It's, it's yes, I'm a... Catholic, but I really have no intention and will not live as a Catholic. Even his approach to his own is being gay, right? You would think somebody like him who makes such a big deal about being gay and about doing the things that he do, he describes, he describes often uh, what he does as a gay man and the sexual acts involved um, are very explicit in his uh, uh, talks. Uh, You'd expect him to say, you know, I'm gay and I'm kind of and, and I'm proud of it. But but he's not. He, he says he says, look, I'm gay and I wish I wasn't. Um, I, I'm gay, but the Bible condemns gays uh, and the Bible and, and God condemns gays and God's right. Right. He has to be right. So I messed up. I, I'm, I'm completely screwed up. Um, I, you know, I'm a bad person in the sense that I'm gay. Right. It's. You know, he's again, he is a, uh, you know, there's an element of safe self-hatred there, but it's consistent with this knocking stuff down. It's consistent with this splintering everything up. It's consistent with this chaos. There's no cohesive agenda here. There's no cohesion to it. There's no, I mean, if he was a Catholic and said, I'm a Catholic, and because I'm a Catholic, I'm going to give up my gay lifestyle. Uh, I'm going to stop doing all the things that I'm doing because it's condemned by the Bible. 
All right, well, there's consistency there, but the whole point of his shtick, the whole point of what he's doing is to be inconsistent. The whole point is the shattering of everything. Now, this is what he's saying. I'm not making this up, this, this idea of, and, and he actually says, he goes on when he says that he's a sinner and he's a very enthusiastic sinner. Note, he's an enthusiastic sinner. Think about what a real Catholic thinks about an enthusiastic sinner. And then he goes on, and this is in a written talk. This is in a written talk. You can find it, and we'll, we'll get to the topic of the talk in a minute. This is a talk about abortion. But this is a talk he gave in January of this year, of this year. And here's what he's saying. As someone once said, I might be bad, but imagine, imagine how much worse I'd be without God. So he's an absolute sinner according to the Bible, but he'd even be a bigger sinner if he didn't believe in God. Now, you know, just to give you again a little bit of background, he was born Jewish, converted to Catholicism. So Catholicism is not just some random thing he chose. He, he, he was born into. He chose to be a Catholic. He chose to be a Catholic, and he's choosing to be a sinner, and he's choosing to be a super sinner, right? Again, his words, not mine. I, I don't know what he does in his private life. For all I know, it's all an act. But the fact that this is the act, the fact that this is what he wants to highlight, and this is what he chooses to highlight, you know, says it all. Right? Says it all. All right, we've got a, a caller. I'm going to take a caller, and then we'll go. I've got a lot more to say about Milo. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Hello? Hey, yeah. Go ahead and, and uh, speak okay. up. You're yeah, a little soft. Tom from Austin. Speak up. Hey. Um, yeah, the, the only thing I'm wondering about is why is Milo important? Good question. So the reason Milo's important is because he's become important. I mean, I don't decide who's important and who isn't important. I look out there in the culture, and I, and I ask, you know, what are people talking about? What are people, you know, when, when he goes to campuses, uh, the left demonstrates, often riots, uh, university uh, provosts or, or presidents deny him access to some universities, and he fills the auditorium up, with hundreds of people. These are the people I want. I want them to come to my talks. You know, this is my audience, but they would much rather listen to Milo than listen to me. Um, he's important because he wrote regularly for Breitbart and everybody quoted him. He's important because the culture we live in, this is what they've embraced on the right. This is what the culture has embraced, particularly, particularly. Um, young people. So particularly the people yeah, well, we want to get to. So I think it's important to understand what it is about the culture that makes Milo important, right? Because he is, he's a reflection of the state of the culture in which we live. And I think it's important that we understand it. I think it's important we try to address it, try to figure out what the issue is so that we can go out there and fight for the souls of these poor people who are sucked in by him. Yeah, well, I don't feel like fighting for the soul of people that are sucked into them, to be quite honest with you. Um, well, nobody, if, if, you look, if you look at, at fifth, if you look at people who are 15 to 25-year-olds today, they are either on the right sucked in by Milo or either on the left sucked in by Bernie Sanders and the feminist and Black Lives Matter and everything else, which is the equivalent of Milo on the left. That is the cultural landscape that we all live in, to ignore that, yeah. to ignore that is a big mistake, particularly if you want to change it. You have to understand what it is. You have to understand what is going on. Maybe the conclusion is everything's lost. Let's go to New Zealand. Um, or maybe the conclusion is how do we, how do we fight this and, and how do we structure our arguments in order to fight it? But it's, this is the world we live in. And, and this is why he's important. He's important because he's a reflection of the world we live in. We better know our enemy. We better know what's out there. And, and, uh, and, and you know, so that we can fight it. Okay, but it sounds like you're allowing the left or the radical whatever um, to set your agenda. Well, but they why do set they the agenda. Set the They're agenda. setting the agenda of the culture. They are the culture. They are, they are the ones defining the terms out there. They, are, they, they dominate the intellectual high ground. They dominate the universities. 
who I mean, yes, they are. You know, if you if you look if you look at Ayn Rand and what Ayn Rand wrote, every single one of these essays is is addressing some evil that the left back in the sixties and seventies was uh, was uh, 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 yeah. you know a- applying to Amer- to the American people. This is the world we live in, and we need to combat it. And we haven't won yet. We're still losing. Okay. Um, I guess you're trying to change the culture. I would prefer just to ignore it. Well, but but ignoring is giving up, and I can't give up. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. No, ignoring it is giving up because because we live in the world. We live in a culture. We live in a place where a the culture elects politicians. The culture determines what movies we get. The culture determines the way people talk to each other. The culture is what shapes the quality of life that you live, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. If you don't change the culture, we've lost. And it, this is a cultural this is a cultural fight. It, it's not it, it, the way to change the culture is through philosophy, but the culture is where the battle is being waged. And if you ignore it, you've lost it. And Ayn Rand never ignored it, by the way. Ayn Rand was heavily no, engaged no, in the cultural b- battle, cultural war. Yeah, but I have my own life to lead, and sure, I don't really care about all these people. Um, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. I agree with you, but you, what you should, the only reason you should care about them is whether you like it or not, they're making your life harder to live the way you'd like to live. That's a fact. Wow. So I'm my argument Milo. is you don't have Milo to deal with them. Live. What's that? How is Milo making my life harder to live? Well, of course he is because he's, he's affecting the way people talk to each other. He's impacting the kind of movies you're going to see. He's impacting the, the whole culture around you, the whole way in which people are living, the whole way in which, uh, y- you know, uh, y- y- Donald Trump got elected partially because of Milo and people like that. Uh, Donald Trump was the choice. The choice was between Clinton and Trump was because this is the culture. Okay. I, I guess I'm not as attuned to the culture as, as you are. but uh, No, not your job, I, and you I, shouldn't I, be. I understand your point. Yeah, and I agree with you. You shouldn't have to worry about this. You should just live your life. You're hiring me to have to go out to fight there and to fight the battle for you. I hope you contribute to the Iron Man Institute because we're waging the battle and it's a battle for all of us. Uh, so thanks for calling. I really appreciate it. And as I said, you. you should all be contributing to the Iron Man Institute where this battle is being waged so that you don't have to go and read Milo's talks and listen to his commentary and do all this stuff because it's pretty painful. It's time sacrificing for your sake and I want some dough. Uh, I want something uh, in, in response. Um, Somebody's saying, you know, they listen to Milo, but they don't take him seriously. Fine, but a lot of people do. And the fact is, he is serious. And the fact is, he's not a comedian. He's not out there just to entertain. He's presenting a point of view. It's a point of view that many people share with him. Um, and, you know, this is, this is, the, this is the reality in, in which we live. And I don't think you can just listen to Milo and shrug. This guy has some really, really nasty things to say about the world in which we live. And uh, he's part of the problem. And, and you have to understand the problem in order to be able to fight it. All right, we're going to take another call. Hi, you're on the Yohan Brooks Show. Hi, this is Paul Kennedy in Austin. Hey, Paul. Another Austin. Two so- Austins, uh, two out of three today in Austin. <laughs> All right. What's up, Paul? I was wondering to what... So what, to what degree do you see the reaction to Milo, the affinity for him, as um, a positive sign or a mixed sign? Because um, while I you know, reject a lot of what Milo has to say, there's a certain part of me that responds positively to the uh, basically the giant middle finger that he's giving to the insanity on the left. And yep. for so long, it seems like um, you know, people, it's like they, they felt it necessary to prove that they're not uh, you just broke up this. Uh, something broke up there. So, so I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, yep. Um, sorry about that. Something, something went wrong with the audio. Um, yeah. So there's a certain joy, there's a certain value, I guess, one gets from sticking the middle finger to really bad people. 
And I get that. And, and that's what I said. I laugh at some of the stuff he says. Uh, I think that some of the stuff he says is, uh, is right. I think a lot of what he says about the left is accurate and it's right. Uh, it, it, you know, his hostility to a lot of the left's agenda is right on. His defense of free speech, while very weak, unintellectual, emotion-driven, uh, is correct in the sense that he is a defender of free speech and he goes out of his way to try to defend free speech. He's, cor- he's brave, he's courageous. And he goes in front of all these crowds where, where people are trying to really hurt him physically and he does it. But, <laughs> but he's also represents, he, he represents the flip side of the left's nihilism, the flip side of the evil of the left, he's representing on the right. And if this is all the culture has to offer us, which I think it's boiling down to this, is nihilism on the left, nihilism on the right. Um, you know, maybe the nihilism on the right is funnier, more entertaining, and they're sticking the finger to... I just stuck my finger on Facebook Live. There you go. Um, sticking the finger to uh, things that we would like to stick our finger to. But on the other hand, you know, does it in such a emotionalistic, non-reason based example, right? But that's, you know, that's crazy. That, that, that is not helpful, right? Now, I did not say he was bad on free speech. What I said is his argument is incomplete on free speech, right? He's bad on free speech and that he can't really make the argument. I read his stuff on free speech. He basically says, I should be able to say whatever the hell I want to say. And, uh, and he says, uh, if I'm offensive, you know, if, if I offend you, you know, grow, you know, grow a pair and suck it up. But he never talks about reason. He never talks about truth. He never talks about science. He never talks about the fact that some speech is stupid, the fact that some speech is wrong, the fact that some speech is offensive, that just you have a right to say certain things doesn't mean you have to say them. He never talks about what an argument is for free speech in a, in a semi-rational basis. Now, granted, he's no objectivist. I'm not expecting objectivity, but neither is Dave Rubin. But Dave Rubin can make a case for why free speech is essential for the existence of Western civilization in an intellectual way. So can um, uh, Danish cartoon Fleming Rose. Fleming Rose is no objectivist, but he understands the value of reason. He understands the age of enlightenment. He understands the value of science and can make an argument for free speech that is based on reason, based on rationality. Milo doesn't and can't. Right, because he is driven by the subjectivism, the emotionalism, and ultimately he's driven by he's an engine of chaos. And and free speech to him is is ultimately for him just a tool to create that chaos. It's a tool to create that chaos. I mean, that's part of what he is. That's part of what he's uh, what he's about. Uh, he's not he's not an enlightenment figure in that sense. Whereas Fleming and and Dave are. They are, they are trying to ground what they believe in, in a kind of reality-based, reason-based, and they, they're weak on it because they're not objectivists. But Milo is not. It is very, it, it, Milo doesn't even try, right? At least the stuff I've read. Now, maybe I'm missing something, but the stuff I've read, the stuff I've talked, seen him talk about free speech. Now, again, good for him. I'm all for all the allies we can get on the free speech thing. The fact that he stands up and, and is willing to stand up to the senses is a good thing. I, you know, it's sad, I think, to, some, to a large extent, that a lot of the free speech is done in the name of what is objectively truly offensive, uh, what is objectively truly stupid, right? Rather than defending free speech for valuable speech, for, for what is good. And, and you, you can criticize the left, you know, full of criticism, without just being insulting and dumb and emotional and so on. Um, as I said, I mean, Milo's full of contradictions, uh, beyond that, he's also an apologist. 
an apologist for the alt-right. He's not alt-right. And, and, and there's nothing I've seen that suggests that he is a racist or anti-Semitic or any of those things. But he's certainly an apologist for the, for the anti-Semites and for the racists, right? Uh, he basically excuses it. Oh, these are just young people trolling. Excuse me, but trolling anti-Semitism is not excusable. This is an opportunity to educate these people on how stupid what they're doing is, how evil what they're doing is, and that they need to fix their ways, not to excuse it. Not to excuse it, not to, 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 to brush it under the table, right? He says, oh, there's some racist in the old right, but the movement is much bigger than just that. But imagine being in a movement. Imagine being part of a movement in which part of the movement, the only part, right? Only part of the movement was racist. I mean, why would you want to be in the same tent with racists? Racism. One of the most evil ideologies in, in human history. The f- worst, most primitive form of tribalism and collectivism. You want to be in a, in a tent? You know, in a big tent with that, right? The movement, there's a movement here. And some of the movement, you know. I mean, I, I don't know if, if, if you guys know of the tweet that Milo sent Ben Shapiro when Ben Shapiro's child was born, right? Ben Shapiro, who should be, you know, an ally, I guess. They're both conservatives. They're both religious. What did he, what did he, what did he send uh, uh, Ben Shapiro as a tweet? Something about the baby being half black and calling him a cuck, right? And, and you can go look up what cuck means um, if you want, right? And Ben Shapiro and him have had a huge falling out. Uh, you know, so he's an apologist for the alt-right. He's an apologist for the worst racist elements within the alt-right. Even though he's not a racist, he is an apologist for them. He is an engine of chaos. He, he, this is what he thrives on. This is what he loves. This is what he enjoys. His humor is dark and, and offensive purposefully, not just to the left, but to anybody um, anybody out there. And on top of that, he is an apologist for the worst elements of the Catholic Church. The worst element of the Catholic Church. He's an apologist. So this, you got to read the speech he gave on abortion. You know, and then he, he says things like, um, th- this is from the speech, right? He says, uh, Thomas Aquinas and the church aren't the killjoy Puritans that your lying professors claim. Really? They're not? He says, St. Thomas and before him, St. Augustine. Now remember who St. Augustine is. St. Augustine was the guy who used to whip himself because of the evil sexual urges he got. Literally used to whip himself or go roll around in the snow to suppress his sexual urges. These are the people he's trying to defend. I mean, I can see defending Aquinas, but Augustine? Augustine? So not only is he an apologist for racism, he's an apologist. He's an apologist for the Catholic Church. Right? Augustine. Anti sex, anti pleasure, Augustine. <laughs> it's just unbelievable, right? Uh. You know, um, he then goes on, uh, you know, then goes on and on and on about the evil of abortion. Uh, You know, abortion is murder and, uh, you know, feminists love abortion and that's what drives them. And, uh, you know, he's science based and um, and he's going to give reasoned argument for why abortion is wrong. And then all he does is present an emotional argument about abortion. You know, it's bad for women's mental health. He's got some surveys around this. Uh, abortion, And then he says abortion is simply wrong. Argument? There's no argument, right? There's no argument. Um, then he's got this all kinds of, you know, the, the, the fetuses are beneficial to the. I mean, all kinds of stuff that you got to scratch your head and go, what? What? Right? Yeah, so, so of course... I'm reading for my law articles, right? I'm, you know, this is actually what he's saying. This is all, again, you can go. Full text on Breitbart of uh, his po- Cal Poly State University, no dead babies talk. It's right there, right? I'm reading from it. But if you like Milo, then 
this is exactly the same with Trump, right? Nothing I say, no evidence, no quotations, no actual facts will move you. And this is why I've always said the new right is authoritarian. There is no facts, no matter. It's all about emotion. And it's all about, you know, I love Milo, therefore Milo's a good guy, and therefore you're all idiots because you don't love Milo. I love Trump, and Trump could do no wrong. Nothing. This is, this is the mentality of, an authoritarian, of authoritarianism. And this is the mentality of the people who, who criticize anybody who criticized Milo and Trump and, and Bannon and all these guys. It's a mentality of authoritarianism. And this is what I've been saying for months, that what the Trump election reflects and what the Trump candidacy reflected, not the fact that a lot of you voted for Trump. A lot of you voted for Trump because the alternative was Hillary. But the fact of, of, of Trump and the passion people have towards Trump and the apologists, the massive number of apologists for Trump, that is all reflective of a, of a significant move among them, American electorate towards authoritarianism. And, and you're seeing that with a blind defense of, uh, uh, you know, of uh, Milo. Here's a line from him. This is a line from Milo. Babies in the womb. Notice he calls them babies, not fetuses or anything. Like that. Babies in the womb. Are the real undocumented Americans we should care about? Not Mexican gang members or Syrian jihadists. Right? Now, yeah, Milo is not about consistency. Milo is the anti-consistency. Milo is on principle inconsistent. Milo is the nihilists, the es essence of nihilism. Because he's about smashing, he's about chaos, he's about anti-consistency. That's why he's so dangerous. Right? And that's why when you're chaotic, when you're willing to say anything for a laugh, when you're only think, you know, you get into trouble. Like what you got into trouble for in the last week. I mean, you can make rational argument about the age of consent. And you can say, well, the age of consent is too high. Kids, when they're 16, they know what they're doing and, and they, can, they can give consent. You cannot say that about the age of 13. You cannot say that about the age of 14. So there's, there's some line there. And you can have a, a rational argument about where that line is, right? But that's not what Milo did in his interview with Joe Rogan. It's not what Milo did in the other recordings that have come out. Uh, you know, what he said was despicable. What he said was absolutely despicable. And I'm glad that he suffered the fate. And I, and, I, and, I, and I think it's sad that any publisher picked up his book because he was basically, in the name of chaos, in the name of ridiculing everything, in the name of saying everything, in the name of nothing matters, there are no sacred cows, you know, he came out for, even though he denies it, and even though he rejects it, and even though he explicitly says he's not really supportive of this, for pedophilia. So, and that's pretty despicable. I can't think of anything much more despicable than, than, than that. All right, uh, I've got three more callers. People, people are really loving this topic for whatever reason, right? Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Hello? Uh, this is James. Hey, James. How's it going? I'm doing well, doing well. I um, appreciate you taking my call. Sure. Um, I've, been, I've been very fascinated myself with the, um, the nature of the discourse uh, of between uh, objectivists and more broadly libertarians uh, as against the uh, alt-right. And um, I honestly think uh, that Milo Moore essentially embodies a type of misintegration, mobilizing disintegration and chaos yep. for his purposes I, yep. I, you know i don't think i don't think it's absolutely accurate to say he has no principles um you know i think he kind of embodies i mean he describes himself as a uh how do you put it um you know messy and complex yeah uh kind of broken person sure you know? and but he's made a he's uh, made that into an ideology almost. He's made that into his shtick. It's not just right. that he's broken. He feeds off of the fact that he's broken. He makes he makes a big deal out of the brokenness, yeah. right? Well, I think that his psycho epistemology comes through in that regard. I agree. And I, I mean, as I just as I listen to the the discussion today, I think in so many ways, 
how his his psychology. I don't want to. I'm not trying to psychologize him. I'm just yeah. saying, in terms of you know his own words about um, things to do with um, his sexual experiences with Catholicism, um, you know, uh, other things um, in terms of the broader culture, as you were discussing before, he has a generative context where he's counteracting the type of emotionalism that the left has created yep. uh, and harnessed in order to uh, fight capitalism, as, as far as I'm concerned. It's, its primary enemy is capitalism. It's well, I think, I think it's worse than that. I, capitalism is its political manifestation. The primary enemy is the individual. The primary en enemy is reason. That's the right. end game. The end game is to destroy yep. reason, destroy the individual, and the end game is authoritarianism. That's true on the left. And I think what happens is that Milo is reflecting that back to them and thus embracing the methodology on the right. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and, and so it, it's an emotionalism mobilized to fight. And I, I, think, he's, I, I think he is honest when he says he's, he's a mess, you know. Yep. And, and, but I think, yep. I think that's I right. I wonder, okay, so if I could be uh, mildly critical. Um, sure. I, I noticed in Objectivist that... There seems to be, and I'm, I consider myself an objective, yep. but I notice other objectives tend to, on this issue, um, magnify the negative of a misintegrated psyche, you know, of, of, a, of a bad um, philosophical base. And, in, and I wonder if it's because the generative context, the, the cultural, uh, I, don't, I hate to use the word zeitgeist because of its roots, but yeah. the, the, the thing that you, you want to fight, okay, is 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 met, is uh, at a state now in the culture that you have to resist uh, the alt right more than the left. Yep. So maybe your strongest message is being directed in that way. But but but, but let, so know. let me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I get what you're, what you're saying. I'm gonna I'm gonna disconnect you right now just because I've got other callers. But let me say this: the battle, the real battle is between reason and emotion. The real battle is between individualism, between, uh, uh, between uh, self-interest and altruism. The real battle is between individualism and collectivism. Those are the real battles. When you look at the alt-right, and, and you look at Milo and people he represents. Now again, it's variation. Milo might not be as bad as some of the alt-right, but, but he's bad, right? And you see where they fall down on that axis. Are they self-interested individuals versus altruism. What they're preaching is altruism. You know, that's what his whole Catholicism is about. It's about altruism. Now, he projects it in this individualistic anything goes kind of way. But at the end of the day, he's asking the mother to sacrifice for the fetus, right? Um, the anti-reason and pro-emotion, left and right. And the anti-individualism, pro-collectivism, left and right. Now, Milo... I think is anti everything. This is what makes him a nihilist. He's not an altruist. He's not really an egoist. He's not a collectivist. He's not an individualist. He's nothing. And I'll talk about that in a minute because I want to get to this idea of anti ideology. He's an anti ideologist. But I think the entire political map today is anti ideological. There are no principles. In that sense, they're all our enemies because, uh, yes, we might agree on the evil of modern feminism. Absolutely. Milo is mostly right in his condemnation of modern feminism. And it's funny and it's entertaining and mostly right. But that doesn't change the fact that he's also against a lot of things that we really value. And he's not on our side in any kind of sense. So it's not that I'm going to pass out, this is the good stuff, this is the bad side, let, listen to the good stuff. No, what he represents, because he's an agent of chaos, what he represents is chaos. What he represents is nihilism. That's what Milo represents. And it's not something we should just say, okay, well, there's some good things about Milo. No, the very essence of Milo is bad. The very essence of the alt-right is bad. Even if the alt right is only a counter reaction to the left, to the left craziness. But that's where we place ourselves. And I think this election has made it clear, should have made it clear to objectivists. It's us against the world. It really is. 
at the philosophical, deepest philosophical level, at the level of reason versus emotion, even deeper than that, at the level of the primacy of existence versus the primacy of consciousness. It's at the very philosophical level, we, it's us against the world. And what the world holds, left, right, alt-right, alt-left, what they hold, with some few exceptions, is a disintegrated mess, a disintegrated mess, which doesn't yet add up to anything. The only people who have any kind of coherence are on the right, and then the religious nuts. Everybody else, it's complete disintegration, it's complete chaos, it's exactly what Milo wants, and that's the world we live in. Now, everybody said, but yeah, but the silent majority of Americans are not alt-right and they're not alt-left. That's true, but they're also insignificant. The fact is that the vast majority of Americans don't matter. What matters is the people who shape the culture. And somebody asked, why does Milo matter? Because Milo shapes culture. Because people pay attention to Milo. People listen to him. People go and watch his lectures. People watch his YouTube videos. By the millions. So his message is out there among the people who are going to influence the culture. And the vast, silent majority of America is silent. And therefore, they're not going to have an influence on the culture. And therefore, when an election comes, they're, going to, they're just going to vote for Donald Trump because that's, they, that's their response to the evil of leftism. So they're going to take this evil guy on the right. So this matters in a, in a, deep, deep, in a deep, deep sense. It matters culturally, and it's a philosophical battle. Milo very much exudes a primacy of cult, a, a privacy of consciousness mentality. Right? It's a primacy of consciousness mentality that says, you know, I'm Catholic, but I'm a sinner, and I commit worse sins than anybody, but I'm a Catholic, and I love God, and God loves me. And I mean, it's complete disintegration. It's complete. Where's the reality? Where's the fact? He keeps saying he's science-based, but he never presents science. Because he can't. He doesn't really have science. doesn't believe in science. The best he can come up with when it comes to science is surveys. Survey data on what people think. Not actual science. Right? And of course, that's in metaphysics and epistemology. It's all about emotion. It's all about what feels right, what feels good to him. And that's why he's willing to say anything, outrage anybody, insult anybody, because it's just emotion. Who cares about emotion? Now, he has a right to do it for a political right, but is it good communication? Is it the right way to deal with people? Is this the kind of culture we want to live in when we all insult each other all the time? Not insult each other because we're debating ideas, but insult each other because we're insulting each other. We're calling each other fat and, and all kind of other, you know, worse insults. I, you know, again, I, I find it hard to say this kind of stuff because I'm not the kind of person who uses that kind of language. You know, maybe you guys are, I don't know. I, I, find, I find swearing hard, unless I do it in Arabic. And then I could, then I could, then I, then I would do pretty well. I think I can, I can swear okay in Arabic, but in English it's tough. All right, uh, we got, we got a bunch of more callers. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show, who's this? Aloha, it's Stuart. Hey, Stuart. You have to do it quickly because I want to wrap up this segment because I want to get to the uh, anti-ideology. Go ahead. Okay, so I see all these apologists for Milo saying he only picks on leftists, crybullies who deserve it, and that's not true. I can tell you the exact moment when I became disillusioned with Milo because I was a fan of him during Gamergate when I thought he was staying up for a video game nerd. I can tell you exactly when I became disillusioned with him. On Twitter, he, this is the story he told. He was working out at the gym. And he saw this fat guy from several yards away, really fat guy, working out on one of those exercise machines. And Milo was so offended seeing a fat guy that he took a photo of that guy without his permission and tweeted it out and said, yeah. fat has to be shamed anywhere you see it. Yeah. No, I've so seen him do that. His own business. No, I, I think that's right. And this is, again, what he wants is, and it's pure emotion, he's a good-looking, thin guy. And, and he, he wants, he enjoys putting stuff down. Now, there's a, there's a fine line between saying, you know, being fat is unhealthy for you. You really should get on top of it. And in between insulting somebody you don't know, that person could have a medical reason why he's fat. There could be multiple reasons why he's fat that have nothing to do with the so-called 
it, it's not good for you, which is Milo's excuse for why he goes after fat people. Right? And there's, an, there's another element here. What he wants to do is he wants to attack the leftist idea, all body shapes are okay, right? That kind of notion, which, you know, there's a sense in which I think that's a good thing to say all body shapes are okay, but there's also a sense of justi justifying people who don't exercise and abuse their body and treat themselves badly. But it's not what Milo's really trying to do. Milo's really trying to destroy. I mean, he really is trying to shame. He's trying to provoke. He's trying to do all these things, right? He doesn't have the excuse because that guy was exercising. Yeah, no, exactly. And he didn't even know him, and the guy was exercising, trying to make himself, you know, trying to get in shape. So, yeah, no, I agree with you completely. All right, uh, thanks, Stuart. Thanks for calling. One more last one, and then, then I want to take it in a slightly different direction. Hi, you're in the Yuan Book Show. Who's this? Yeah, this is Nick. I've, I've been an objectivist for 25 years. I agree with everything Ayn has said, including on, one, on a woman president. Yep. I am a huge fan of Trump and Milo. Yep. I, I can defend, except for one or two things, everything uh, they have done and said, um, right down to, uh, to evidence. And uh, so... Uh, I yeah, I, so okay. So here you go. I so to so I want you to defend content. the idea that he's a Catholic but, and a sinner. So, and that's great, uh, and that, and that's something to be to be admired and cherished and and promoted. The context is uh, uh, what I can defend it. Uh, the context is why is Milo popular? Uh, he is that's not, not the context. He's, he's giving a talk about abortion, and he's trying to explain where his values come from. And he's saying, "I am a Catholic. I, this is where my values come from, but I reject those values at the same time because I sin constantly." Okay. All right. That's the context. I can defend that. The, the, my defense is he, that is the same as any other dumb conservative who is a theist. Fine. So he's a dumb conservative. We can agree on that. We can agree that there's no difference between Milo and any dumb conservative. But, but you want to say something more. You, you started the conversation by saying you can defend almost everything he's ever said. And I can find you a hundred things. And I, I'm willing to bet you any money you want that I can find a hundred things within context Right. In Milo's written right. speeches, right. that you as an objectivist should, I'm not saying you would, be horrified by and reject. And I won't even get to Trump because Trump is worse in that respect. But, okay, so this is, when I say defend, I mean the context of what, uh, what they say. So you are now in the context of Milo is this awful person, a nihilist, which is ridiculous. Yeah, um, it's exactly what he is. He calls now. himself, he calls himself, you explain this, that he calls himself an engine of chaos and thrives on that. And, and he says it over and over again. What is that? Is that not nihilistic? Okay. That does, just because somebody says something, it doesn't mean that he's not a philosopher. He's not, he I see again. So, so anything I say, what? you're going to say he, doesn't, he didn't mean it. I mean, that's ridiculous. If you believe it, if you interrupt the sentence every time I start it, you're not going to get the full context. And so it's going to sound like I'm doing that. If you get the whole context, it won't. <laughs> Go ahead. So, all right, so the context is Milo is, uh, when I say defending everything they say, I don't mean defending them, therefore they're objective. It's obviously Trump is... Uh, is no, no, I'm going to stop you again, because my standard is not being an objectivist. It's just being a, a, a decent, a pro, uh, a, you know, pro-values human being. Not an objective, that's not the standard. The objectivism that's is a that's false that's standard that's to that's judge that's people. That's You're wrong. Yeah. You're wrong. That's why you got to let me finish the whole paragraph. No, but you say stuff that's just so ridiculous. You, you, you're accusing me, you're accusing me implicitly of using objectivism as a standard by which I'm measuring Milo, and I never have. No. Okay, so can, let me finish the whole body, even though if it starts off something like that. Go ahead. I finish what I'm saying, and it still does that, then you can answer it. So the context is, he's not an objectivist, but the context is he's a terrible person, for instance, that Trump is an authoritarian, Milo's a nihilist, he's all this, and then, then he starts discussing these points that, that uh, for instance, Catholicism, I'm not defending him, he's not an objectivist, but I can name you a bunch of other people who have these same views, who are not objectivists, that you are not discussing them as nihilists, you're not discussing them as authoritarian. Give me an example, so one. A lot of people who believe in protectionism, uh, which Ben Shapiro, I'm sure, has all sorts of bad Who's that? I can't, I can't hear you. you can find some Ben Shapiro, I'm sure, has many things to say about abortion, but we're not all going crazy about Ben Shapiro. I haven't done a show yet on Ben Shapiro. When I do, 
I will go crazy about his position on abortion. Absolutely. But, show, but these positions you're bringing up are common to conservatives. Uh, the protectionism on Trump, Milo attacking uh, uh, attacking uh, feminists. You got to you got to uh, Milo bring up his Catholicism. You got to uh, uh, you got to say why does he, why is he uh, being attacked by you now? What is it? When I say defending somebody, uh, it's a better uh, okay. A better so so I I get it. I don't have a lot of time, so I get it. Hold on, no, I don't think. I, have you gotten to the point? Completely. I, I, I don't think I, I didn't sound. It, I, I made it, but it didn't. I don't think it was very clear. Yeah, no, I don't think so either. But my point is this. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I don't consider myself a conservative. I think conservatives are idiots, and I'll talk about conservatives if I have time in a minute. And 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 I think that in many respects they're no better than the left, and in in some respects they're worse than the left, much worse than the left. I have a respect for Ben Shapiro, and any day I'd will be willing to. Um, analyze the difference between Ben Shapiro and Milo and why Ben Shapiro is a thousand times better than Milo. And, and I'd be happy to discuss that on some occasion. But, but there are a lot of bad people out there. Uh, the fact is that Milo has made himself the center of a whole culture. He's prominent. He's prominent in a way that other conservatives are not. He's funny. He's smart. He's articulate. He's worthy of Going up against, he's worthy of attacking. I'm giving him attention. This is what he loves. Uh, other conservatives are mostly boring and pathetic, and therefore not deserving of Now, protectionism. I have been against, fundamentally, obnoxiously against every single Republican who's ever been a protectionist. I consider protectionism one of the stupidest, dumbest idea in the, the last 240 years since the Wealth of Nations. I went after Huckabee. I went after Santorum. I went after Ted Cruz when he expressed some protectionist ideas. I think they're all idiot populists when they do that. Now, Donald Trump has turned it into an art form. He made it a central issue of his campaign. That's why I go after, and he won, and he's president. That's why I'm going after Donald Trump and protectionism even more. I've been going after the, the ridiculous um, anti-immigration rhetoric of the Republican Party for Many, many election cycles. The idea that I just discovered immigration as an issue because Donald Trump uh, has raised it is ridiculous. I, I remember uh, tweeting the, the presidential debates four years ago and eight years ago. and it, Well, eight years ago, I wasn't on Twitter, but four years ago, attacking immigration. So, yeah, the conservatives suck, and the conservatives are not our friends. And some conservatives are worse than other conservatives. And Milo is an example of a conservative who's, who's a, who is a disintegrator, who is a nihilist. And Trump, well, you know what I think of Trump, and, and there'll be plenty of opportunities to talk about Trump. Um, but there is no defense for this other than, other than they're not the left. And the left is so bad that we're willing to accept anybody except the left. That's the only legitimate defense, in my view, of Trump and Milo is that they're not the left. Now, I believe that is a horrible defense because it basically says we've given up, that we've given up on primacy of existence, we've given up on reason, we've given up on, on rational self-interest, we've given up on individual rights, we've given up on individualism, we've suddenly given up on capitalism. And fine, if you want to give up, that's fine. I'm a fighter, and I identify the enemy. The enemy is the left, the enemy is the, is, is the, is the, is the right, the enemy has been the right since, certainly since the 1960s, and certainly now, uh, you know, since the 1980s when Ronald Reagan brought them all majority deep into the Republican Party. The enemy is religion. Yeah, it's lonely to be an objectivist. Don't look to, in order to reduce your loneliness for allies in people like Milo. He's not an ally. He's not a philosophical ally. He might be an ally because he knocks down the left and it's funny. But he's not a philosophical ally. He doesn't contribute to the philosophical defense of positive values. He almost never talks about positive values. And again, I'm not going to talk about Donald Trump today. Okay, one more call. Let's see if we can get this. Hey, hey how's it going? Hello? 714 area code. You're on the Iran Book Show. Nothing, huh? Okay. We got nothing. All right. 
Now, what is at the core of this? And we're going to have to do next show on, on basically on this issue because I talked for more than I wanted to on Milo and we got so many calls. Pretty cool, huh? Um, they measure, you know, supposedly we measure the, the, the uh, you know, how good a, sh- a radio show is, how many callers call up and, and yell at the host. So I'm doing well today. Um, why are we in this state? Why are we in this state? Now, obviously, philosophically, you can take it back to Kant and to, and to German romantic philosophy and, and to Plato and everything like that. But Ayn Rand makes this amazing point, and I, and I really want you, I really encourage you to read an essay called The Wreckage of the Consensus in Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. That's the book. I've got an old, old copy here with me. Um, it's a brilliant essay. It's just so cool. And, and generally, I, I have a feeling many of you while well, you've read Alice Shrugged and maybe you've read some of the key essays, you haven't read some of these other essays of Vines, and, and I really encourage you to do so. And if you haven't read them in a while, even though they're dealing with political issues from the 60s, read them with, a, with kind of a, an approach that looks at, um, with an approach that looks at the relevance of what she's saying for today, for today, right? So this is what she says. She says, the brute facts of a mixed economy a gang rule, a scramble for power by various pressure groups without any moral or political principles, without any program, direction, purpose, or long-range goals, with the tactic, tacit belief in rule by force as their only common denominator, and unless the trend is changed, a fascist state is the ultimate result. Now, this is exactly what we're seeing today. We're seeing the rule because of a mixed economy, because government has so much power over our lives, what we're fundamentally seeing is jockeying among various gangs who all want to control our lives in some way or another for power and all trying to appease us in some way to try to get that power. Now, again, it's a big topic that we're going to have to talk about, but I want to read you this about uh, political ideology. A political ideology is a set of principles aimed at establishing or maintaining a certain social system. So let me just say that, in my view, Milo has no political ideology, that Donald Trump has no political ideology, because they have no set of principles. There are no principles behind this. It is a program of long-range action. There's no long range here. With the principles serving to unify and integrate particular steps into a consistent course, It is only by means of principles that men can project the future and choose their actions accordingly. Now, the old left had principles. The old left had a political ideology. The old left was trying to do something long range, evil as it was. The new left and the new right have no political principle, have no real ideology, are not trying to achieve anything long range. This is why they're all D1s or D2s in Leonard Peikoff's dim spectrum. It's all about disintegration, lack of principle, lack of long-range thinking, emotion, appeasement, trying to manipulate people. Here's the continuation. Anti-ideology, and this is what everybody is today. Anti-ideology consists of the attempts to shrink men's minds down to the range of the immediate moment. Wow, is that a description of Donald Trump. Without regard to past or future, without context or memory, above all without memory, so that contradictions cannot be detected, errors or disasters can be blamed on the victim. I mean, this is straight Donald Trump's position on trade. There is no memory. There is no what's happened in the past. There is no facts. There is no economic science. There is no, you know, there is nothing except what I'm saying right now, the assertiveness with which I'm saying it, and, you know, and the emotion it evokes in you. In anti-ideological practice, principles are used implicitly and are relied upon to disarm the opposition, but are never acknowledged and are switched at will. So you switch principles constantly when it suits the purpose of the moment. It's pure pragmatism. It's exactly what she's describing, which is anti-ideological. 
What purpose? The gangs, the deplorables, you know, manufacturing workers who've lost their jobs, whatever the gang happens to be. Thus, men's moral criteria becomes not my view of the good, of the right, of the truth, but my gang, right or wrong. And let me just say to those of you who are so pro-Trump that you can defend everything that he's done, as, as one of the callers suggested, that you can defend that, that it, when he does things that Obama, that are similar to Obama, and if Obama would have done, you would have criticized him to height, to, to all, you know, hugely. And now you're defending him hugely. You know, if, if Obama had passed the Muslim ban, you would have said it's too weak and too pathetic. Obama, uh, Trump passes it, oh, huge step in defending America. Right? This is exactly what she's describing here. Right? Thus, men's moral criteria becomes not my view of the good or the right or the truth, but my gang, right or wrong. This is what makes today's public issues and discussions so sickingly false and futile. Wrong premises. And, uh, yeah, so, sorry, most issues rest on so many wrong premises and carry so many contradictions that instead of the question who is right, one is constantly and tacitly confronted with the question, which gang do you want to support? And that's what we've come to in, in, our, in our dialogue in America. It's about which gang, which group of bastards do you want to support? Is it the leftists who we hate? Is it the rightists who I hate? I don't know about you guys. But which gang? Not what's true. Not what's reality. So, for example, you know, and, and again, I think next, I think next show I'll just do on this because there's so many cool examples. She gives the example of the Vietnam War, right? Her example is the Vietnam War, and she goes to the whole discussion about how everything about the Vietnam War is wrong. So it's hard even to anchor any kind of discussion. Where do you even start? Everything about it was wrong. The way it was done, the reason it was done, everything, right? So you fought the Vietnam against the Vietnam War. That's like, do you beat your wife once or twice a day? Right? There's no answer to it. You can't be for, you can't be against, because everything about the context is wrong and distorted and lacks principle and, and is quicksand. So no matter how you answer the question, unless you're Ayn Rand, and then you untangle it. And the same thing about, about you know, uh, it, it, the way we talk about Islam today. It's the same thing. Right? Aren't you, uh, don't you want to, uh, uh, aren't you supportive of Trump's tough stand against uh, Islamic radicals? No. <laughs> not because I'm not for a tough stand against Islamic radicals. I am much tougher than, than, than anything that Trump has suggested. Not because I support the leftist, and, you know, pro-Muslim stand. The same with the discussion of the Muslim ban. Aren't you, you know, if you're against the Muslim ban, then you must be for... Uh, open borders for all Muslims. If you're against Trump's Muslim ban, then you must be a leftist. If you're against Trump's Muslim ban, all false alternatives, I get this every single day on Twitter and Facebook, these so-called false alternatives where there's no thinking going on. No thinking going on. It's exactly this no principle. And, and it's partially, I mean, I'm yelling at you, but it's not your fault in a sense that this is the culture. The culture is an anti-ideological culture. The culture has taken all principles out. The, everything's murky. Everything's in a fog. You can't take a stand. You can't be clear-cut. You can't, you can't see things straight. And nobody does. Right? Nobody does. So I want to talk next time about about how anti-ideology really affects, well, next time on the time of that, one of these times, because I'm going to be away for a while, how this anti-ideology frames all of our discussions and how everybody out there, you know, a lot of you included, you, you want simplicity. You want, you know, A or B. You want two choices, A or B. But you struggle when both A and B are wrong. And the actual answer is C, and C is even less popular than any thing in A and B. 
you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm trying to, trying to shut up between philosophical abstractions and concrete. Um, but there's a simplicity. It's left or right. It's Milo or the modern feminist movement. No, it's neither one of those. It's not left or right. They're all wrong. And, and it doesn't mean that the only right people objectivists, although that happens, to, there's some allies. There's some people who are better on the left and on the right who are somewhat allied with us. But then at the end of the day, yeah, everybody's wrong except us. And you can't jump to support this gang warfare because the one gang right at this particular me moment seems to be more appealing to you than the other gang. But, but that's what I'm seeing out there. That's what I'm seeing by so many people. You, you, you can't take these, well, if Iran is uh, for open immigration, then he must be for massive Muslim immigration into the United States, because that's what open immigration, you, you, you know, you don't listen to what I say, one. You don't, you, 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 you're not thinking, right? You know, applying philosophy to concrete ideas in reality is not easy. And it's not simplistic answers. It, read Ayn Rand. Read, read, I'm not claiming to be anywhere close to Ayn Rand's level at this. But it's, it, it's complicated. And, it's, and there's subtleties. And there's, I'm a for open immigration, but here in these contexts, this is what you do, and this is how you deal with this, and this is how you evolve towards that. This is the ideal in a free society, and this is the evolution. But nobody cares about any of that. I'm for Muslim immigration into the United States on a massive scale. That's how people have defined it. Now I'm getting, I'm getting defensive. Anyway, anti-ideology, this whole idea of the world we live in today is, is pure pragmatism. It's pure emotionalism. Uh, Milo is a wonderful example of this. There's no principles in what... I mean, if he had made a principle argument against abortion, really taking Thomas Aquinas and Augustine seriously and presenting that argument... Which, which is what I think a Ben Shapiro would do, then I would disagree, but I would say, okay, I see he's got a political ideology, he's very religious, here's how you combat it. But, but, this, but what Milo does is spew emotions, spew the facts that are relevant. He keeps saying, I, I, I'm all about facts, but he never gives them. And in the meantime, he's trying to insult as many groups as he, as many people and as many groups as he can. Notice that it's about groups, Right? He claims to be an individualist, but he's constantly talking about people in groups. So we live in a screwed up world. And, and I know you guys want to find anything that, you know, that, that maybe is a glimmer of hope and something good. And I'm, I'm the bearer of horrible news. And, and, and that horrible news is it ain't there. The, the, the good news is not in the realm of ideas. The good news is not in the realm of politics. If you want good news, go, to, go and watch people uh, produce in northern Ar northwest Arkansas and Silicon Valley. Those are my examples these days. Go watch innovation. Go watch production. You know, in that realm, there's still good things going on. Well, I mean, you know, somebody says Milo doesn't claim to be an individualist. I don't think he's actually claimed, but he, I think if he was asked, are you an individualist or collectivist, he would definitely say he's an individualist. And it's this, this notion of individualism is based on emotion, is based on saying whatever you want to say, is based on being different, right? Yeah, you want some good news? Read uh, Johann Norberg's uh, book called Progress, excellent book called Progress about the good things that are happening in the world. It ain't Milo. That's not a good thing happening in the world. Right? And, and I encourage you to read his speeches if you're, not, if you're not convinced. And yeah, I mean, you can explain him as, as a backlash against the left. But I don't think you can justify him. Explaining is not justifying. I understand the context of what he's doing. The context is there are riots at Berkeley. People, people are punching people in the face. People are using pepper spray. And he is... The backlash to that, but the backlash should be reason. The backlash should not be uh, chaos, preaching of chaos, the advocacy for chaos, and the advocacy for, you know, 
anti-abortion, uh, you know, but, that, but that, you know, that's the most religious of his talks, although he mentions his Catholicism in almost every single one of his talks. It's, it's a big deal for him, and the fact that he, he's a sinner is a big deal for him as well. All right, so uh, here we are. Um, those of you who want deep philosophical discussions, uh, you know, well, we covered selfishness in the beginning. We did a case study on selfishness in the beginning, uh, I'm curious what you guys think of that. How many of you would give up the kidney to save seven people's lives? Uh, it's kind of a, it's almost like a trolley example where you walk off the trolley and let people die, um, which is, which is, you know, it's it's a better trolley example because there's actually a a rational egoistic thing to do uh, versus the trolley example, where it's just how many people are going to die and you get to choose, which is stupid. The whole setup is stupid. Um, so we talked a little bit about selfishness. You, you've got my bottom line on, um, on Milo. As I said in a previous show, I think he's a nihilist. Now I know he is, you know, a different type of nihilist, not the nihilist of the left, the nihilist of the right, but essentially about chaos and about disintegration and about destruction. Uh, and um, next time we'll see, I'll probably be doing my next show from London. Not sure what day, not sure what time. But I'm also thinking about doing a podcast like when I'm traveling, like a travel log podcast. So just like half an hour of my travel stuff. So uh, that might be happening next week as well, depending on how much time I have and depending on whether I have wired internet in my hotel rooms and everything else. But uh, I'll be in England this week uh, speaking at high schools. I will be in Colombia, Bogota, Colombia. Uh, in, in a week and a couple of days doing a bunch of events. So if you live in Bogota, Colombia, some of those events will be open to the public. So keep your eye open for those. Uh, uh, test out, uh, go check out Elite University. They'll have the information. And after that, I'll be in Denver for a couple of public events you can watch for. And then in Chicago for public events. So uh, if you live in Chicago or you live in Denver, I'm coming to your city. Watch my Twitter, watch my Facebook, and you'll get information about that. If you're in London, sorry, none of the events are really public. Um, so uh, I'm sorry you're going to miss on them. And uh, in Bogota, if there's anybody listening from Bogota, I'll see you in a week and so. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Wish me a good flight uh, tonight, and I will see you next time.